Hi everyone, welcome back to Chemistry. In this video, we're gonna talk about limiting reactants and percent yield. And this is actually the last video in our module five study guide. Um, before we get into it though, I wanted to mention, um, you might have been looking at the titles of the last couple videos and um, also at your study guide and notice this word uh, stoichiometry. Um, I mentioned the word very briefly, but I never actually defined it. Um, and your book doesn't really either. So I just wanted to mention it real quick um, because even though we haven't defined it, we actually have been doing stoichiometry. So in the last couple of videos, we learned how to use a chemical reaction, a balanced chemical reaction to uh, get some quantitative data. So we could say, hey, if we started with this many grams of substance A, how many grams of substance B do I expect to get out? Um, or if I have this many moles of substance A, how many moles of substance B do I have? Uh, and so on. So doing those calculations is actually stoichiometry. Um, and, and chemists use uh, stoichiometry all the time um, when uh, they're working in the lab. So um, it'll become very, you'll, you'll get very familiar with it, but I, I did want to make sure you uh, recognize that word um, in the future because in future chemistry classes you probably will hear that quite a bit. So that's what uh, stoichiometry is and now let's get into the new stuff. Um, I actually want to tell you a story though to talk about something called limiting reactants. So um, say the other day um, a friend of yours asked you if you wanted to go to a potluck and you said, yeah, definitely, I'm, I'm happy to come. Um, I'll bring, you know, something good to share. And, you know, I'm so excited. But you got so busy studying for chemistry class that you forgot that you had to do that. So it's an hour before the potluck and you're like, oh my gosh, I still have to make something for the potluck. I forgot to buy anything. I better get, whip something up in the kitchen. So you go into your kitchen and the only thing you have is uh, stuff to make a ham and cheese or ham and cheese sandwiches. Um, plain ham and cheese sandwiches. I know, kind of, just kind of boring. Just stick with me. So you only have stuff to make ham and cheese sandwiches and you decide that for each sandwich, for each sandwich you make, you want to have two slices of bread one slice of cheese and three slices of ham. And you want every single sandwich to be the same because you don't wanna like not give the same type of sandwich to everybody, right? So you go into your pantry and your fridge and you say, and you notice that you have um, 20, and let's do this in different colors, 20 slices, whoops, 20 slices of bread because you have a whole loaf. Um, you have, I guess we'll do cheese in blue. You have 10 slices of cheese. And you have um, 15 slices of ham. Okay, so what you want to know is how many total ham and cheese sandwiches can you make with what you have? Because remember, you don't have time to go to the grocery store. But it's not quite as simple as looking at your ingredients that you have and saying, okay, well, I'm noticing that this is the lowest number, so I, I must be able to make 10 sandwiches. That's not quite right because each of your sandwiches requires a different number of each uh, ingredient. So we have to solve this another way. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's just go ahead and set it up like we would a dimensional analysis problem. And in fact, actually first, what I wanna do is I wanna make a, a balanced equation for my ham and cheese sandwich recipe. So for, from this recipe, I'm seeing that I am going to use two slices of bread and we'll say, uh, yeah, we'll just write bread like that. Uh, plus one slice of cheese, one cheese, plus three ham. And that's gonna give me um, one sandwich, right? That's how, that's how much of each of those things it takes to make one sandwich, 
Okay, so there's my balanced uh, equation. All right, so now we got to look at each of these ingredients and we got to say, all right, how many sandwiches can I make from that particular ingredient? So let's actually color code this. We want green and this, whoops. No, we want that to be green. We don't want this to be green though. We want this to be red. All right, so now we wanna know which of our ingredients limits the amount of sandwiches that we can make. Which one of these ingredients is our limiting reactant, right? These are all my reactants, and I wanna know, hey, which one of these limits the amount of sandwiches I can make? Okay, so let's try the bread first. So for bread, I have 20 slices of bread. All right. And I wanna know how many sandwiches can I make from that 20 slices of bread? Okay, so from our reaction here, how many breads do I have to put in to make one sandwich? Yeah, two breads, right? Two breads. So I need two breads down here and one sandwich up there. And that's gonna allow me to cancel those breads, okay? All right, so now, now we figured out from my bread how many sandwiches I can make. So let's see, that's gonna be, oh, that's just 20 divided by two, which is just 10. So I can make 10, what, 10 sandwiches from my bread. What about from my cheese? So I start with 10 slices of cheese that's how much I have available, right? Because I can't go to the grocery store. So how many slices of cheese makes how many slices of sandwiches? What's my ratio there? Yeah, one cheese per every one sandwich. Okay, so now I can cancel out those cheeses. So cheese and cheese, and I'm left with just sandwiches. So it looks like I can make 10 sandwiches from my cheese too. Okay, now let's try our ham. So 15 hams, that's how much ham I have. Um, and looking at my chemical reaction, it looks like I can, I have three hams in every one sandwich, right? Where am I getting that from? From our chemical reaction. Well, from, you know, from our reaction there. All right, so 15 divided by three is five, five sandwiches. And hams cancel out. All right, so looking at this, let's zoom out just a little bit. Which ingredient is my limiting, is limiting the amount of sandwiches I can make? Which ingredient is my limiting reactant? Yeah, it's my ham, right? My ham is the limiting reactant because I can only make five sandwiches. So I only have this many ingredients to work with and the ham is limiting the amount of sandwiches I can actually make. So we would call our ham my limiting reactant because it's the one that limits the amount of product, right? Product on the right side that I can make. Yeah. And the reason that I had to convert to sandwiches here is because I needed to be able to compare. If I have sandwiches versus um, bread, I can't really compare all of my products easily, right? All right, so in chemistry, we do the same thing. We try to find what uh, reactant is um, limiting my reaction, limiting the amount of product that I can get. Extra ingredients are called excess reactants because you have let more of them left over. I guess cheese is also an excess reactant. Okay, so a reactant that does not completely react and is left over at the end of the reaction is called an excess reactant.
All right, so let's go ahead and try this out with, a, with an actual chemistry example. So if three moles of CO, what's CO? Yeah, carbon monoxide, right? And five moles of hydrogen are the initial reactants. How many moles of ethanol, sorry, methanol can be produced and what is the limiting reactant? Okay, let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit and try this out. Uh, zoom out a little more. Hopefully you can still see that okay. Okay, so we, we start with, um, let's just go ahead and copy our reaction over here. So we've got CO plus 2H2, um, giving us CH4O. So first things first, let's double check that this is balanced. We got one carbon on the left, one on the right, one oxygen on the left, one on the right, and four hydrogens on the left and four on the right. Yes, so it is balanced, so perfect. Okay, so now let's look at these reactants. What we wanna know is how much of this we can make. So that's our goal, how much of that can we make? And we want that in moles. So actually, let me do question mark moles. Um, and we know that we have, we start with three moles of our CO and five moles of our H2. Okay, so let's go ahead and, I don't know, let's start with CO. Three moles of CO and we got five moles of H2. Okay, so I'm gonna set up two equations because I have two reactants, and I wanna know how much product each of those reactants can make. Okay, so I got three moles of CO. So now I wanna know, I wanna end up with moles of my product, moles of my product. So that's gonna be on the top, right? And then moles of CO needs to be on the bottom because I need it to cancel. So what are the numbers that go here and here? Yeah, one mole of CO is reacting to give one mole of CH4. Or in other words, the, their mole to mole ratio or mole to mole factor is one to one, okay? All right, so Let's just continue on in this first example here. And let me just go ahead and color code this. Whoops, wrong color. Yellow for this one. Blue for this one. All right. So three moles of CO times one divided by one is just three, right? Three moles of cancel out those two and we get CH4O our product, right? So three moles of CH4O can be produced from three moles of CO. All right, what about H2? So now we gotta see the mole to mole ratio of hydrogen to our product, methanol. So how many moles of hydrogen react to form how many moles of methanol? Yeah, it's a two to one ratio, two moles of H2 react to give us one mole of CH4O. All right, and then we can cancel out those moles of H2. And we're left with 2.5 moles of CH4O. All right, so which one of these numbers is smaller? Yeah, 2.5 is smaller. 2.5 is smaller. So because we can only make 2.5 moles of methanol from hydrogen, from five moles of hydrogen, hydrogen is our limiting reactant. Hydrogen is the one that is going to limit our reaction, okay? So once all that hydrogen's used up, we, don't, we can't make any more of that methanol. So that hydrogen is our limiting reactant. It limits how much of our product we get. Yeah. All right. So this asks a couple questions, actually. It asks how many moles of methanol can be produced 
and what's the limiting reactant? So when you answer this question, you're going to say 2.5 moles of methanol can be produced and H2 is our limiting reactant or something along those lines, okay? So sometimes instead of being told how many moles of each reactant we have and determining how many moles of each product we get, we're actually given those values in grams. So we're told, okay, we start with this many grams of silicon carbide and this many grams of carbon, right? And we want to know how many grams of carbon monoxide are formed, okay? So instead of going from moles to moles, right, we're going from grams to grams. And you can do, it's the same process, it's just going to be some extra steps, okay? Sorry, everyone, I just realized that I was saying silicon carbide when I meant <laughs> silicon dioxide. I was looking at SiO2, um, but saying S SIC, basically. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at this. So we are starting with um, our 70 grams of SiO2 and our 50 grams of carbon. And we want to know how many grams of each of those... Or, or how many grams of CO do we get from each of those? So this is actually just a couple extra steps, but it's the same problem solving process that we went over before. So instead of just going from moles to moles, we're going from grams to grams. And we know how to get from grams to moles because we know we can use the molar mass, right? So right here in this step, we're going from grams of sulfur sorry, oh my gosh, silicon dioxide um, to moles of silicon dioxide, okay? And that's going to allow us to then have moles, uh, use our mole to mole ratio, right? Because from our balanced equation, I know how many moles of silicon dioxide react to form how many moles of CO. So now that I'm in moles of silicon dioxide, I can get to moles of carbon, di carbon monoxide, and then I can get from moles of carbon monoxide to grams of carbon monoxide using the molar mass in the last step. So it's kind of like starting with our reactant, getting to, mole, getting to moles of our reactant, and then getting to moles of our product, and then getting to grams of our product, okay? So same thing down here, we start with um, our getting from grams of carbon to moles of carbon, and then we move on to comparing moles to moles, and then we do moles to grams, okay? All right, and now we can see that with um, these two numbers, the smaller number is this one here, right? So that's the smaller amount of product, and that's the amount of product that we can actually make from this, these amounts of our reactants. So what's our limiting reactant? Yeah, so, uh, silicon dioxide. Yeah, silicon dioxide is our limiting reactant because we can only produce um, that amount of product from our silicon dioxide. All right, and then the very last thing I want to talk about is actual theoretical and percent yield. So actual yield, theoretical yield, and percent yield. So when a reaction does not go to completion, that means when the reaction does not actually go all the way, or some reactant or product is lost, the amount of product produced might be less, right? And in, in real life, right, nothing ever goes according to plan perfectly, okay? So um, we, we, even if we're using our best lab techniques, we were extremely careful we still won't get 100% yield, okay? There's, there's always going to be just a little bit that's kind of lost. Um, <clears throat> the, the, because of the law of conservation of mass, that matter is still there, um, but maybe it got stuck on our Weibo or it got stuck in our um, beaker or we actually get a mass that's higher 
than we would expect because we still have some water left in our beaker from when it was washed, stuff like that. Okay, so all of those things affect the actual amount of yield that you, you get for your product. So a theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that you can make. And that's calculated by using a balanced equation. So just like we did up here, where we said, oh, if I start with this many grams of silicon dioxide and I react it in um, the chemical reaction um, above, I'm going to make 65.3 grams. If everything goes according to plan, I can make a maximum of 65.3 grams of carbon monoxide. Okay, so that's the theoretical yield. What could I make in theory if everything went perfectly? The actual yield is what the amount of product that you actually obtained. So how much, maybe in lab, um, I spilled a little bit and uh, instead of getting 65.3 grams of carbon monoxide, I actually got like 62.5, okay? So that number would be your actual yield. How much did you actually make of your product? And then, your percent yield is the ratio of how much you actually made of your product and how much you could have made if everything went perfectly. So remember that percentages are fractions times 100 to get it into a percentage. So this, this times 100 that you see here, that's actually just converting your fraction here into a percentage, okay? So, but your fraction, remember with fractions, that's always uh, part over whole. So theoretical is how much total product, the maximum amount you could make. And actual is how much you, you made in, in lab, how much you actually got out. So this is kind of your whole, and this is part of your whole. It's like uh, if the bottom number was pizza, the top number would be one slice, okay? Right, so how much am I actually making versus how much I could make? Right, I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, as always, let me know, and I'll see you next time.